Good morning. Welcome to Westover Baptist Church online worship service. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together. Know that while we may not be worshiping in the same space, God has his richest blessings for you as you view this service. We invite you to download the worship service bulletin on our homepage. Wherever you find yourself in life, we want this to be a worship experience you can depend on for receiving inspiration, encouragement, and support. Now, wherever you are, whether it's at the kitchen table or on the couch, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Please join us as we sing our first hymn today, number 16, O Worship the King. have a few announcements this morning. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly changed each of our lives, and one of the ways it has made a significant change all around the world and here in Arlington is increasing the need for food assistance. With unemployment levels at generation highs, there are many more people who are in need of food. We have partnered for a number of years with the Arlington Food Assistance Center, and typically we have food drives at least one or two times per year. Westover's Vacation Bible School has been rescheduled for the week of August 3rd. For the safety of our families, staff, and volunteers, Vacation Bible School will look different this year, online and Take-home materials are being created for you and your children. Vacation Bible School activities each day will be conducted using Zoom. The activities will be led by our Vacation Bible School staff and volunteers, and other activities will be parent-led. To register, please go to the church's website. We hope that your child will be able to participate. Although we are not able to be on campus for worship service and our other ministry activities, we do have ongoing expenses to maintain the building, support staff, and to provide community support. 
We are grateful to those who have been able to continue to give during this time. It has been very helpful to us. And we are providing several ways that you can give. You can give online or through our church website. If you go to our website, there is a button that is marked Give on the right-hand side of the home page. You can click that and you are asked for particular information about your gift. You can set up your gift as a one-time gift or a recurring gift and then provide your banking information. Using your mobile phone, you can give by texting. Send a text message to the number 73256 and then in the body of the text message you would type in capital W, capital C, capital A, R, L and the amount of your gift and hit enter. Then a screen will come up and ask you for your banking or credit card information. You may also continue to mail your gift to the church. The mail is monitored daily. You may drop it off to the church and put it in the church office mail slot, which is the door between the flagpoles facing Patrick Henry Drive. Some of you may take advantage of your online banking through your own bank and have the bank send a check through the mail. You may use any of these methods to provide your gift and we sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother, I see my
face of my enemy I see my brother I see my Good morning. The title of our scripture reading today is We Praise God. And it is from Psalms 100 verses 1 through 5 from the New International Version. And it reads, A psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Sing with us our next hymn, number 213, We Will Glorify. We will glorify the King of kings, we will glorify the Lamb, we will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before the throne, we will worship Him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Hello, I'm Reverend Michael Youngblood, and I'm really excited and thankful that you've joined us this day, this hour, as we praise and worship God. In the scripture that Jacqueline read earlier, the psalmist said, this is a day that we worship God. This is a day that we come to him with joyful song. I hope you sang along with Ed, Nancy, and Nellie and Doug as we sing praises to God. He is worthy to be praised. Our Lord is God. He's the maker of heaven and earth. The psalmist says that his goodness endures forever and his faithfulness never goes away. It's for each and every generation. One, another song says, Each day new mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let me share with you several events that are coming up on our calendar very soon. On August 3rd, our Vacation Bible School will begin. As you can imagine, this year is a little bit different. It's going to be virtual. But I'm excited for what God is doing. I've seen some of the previews and, and I'm excited. Each year I watch the children as they grow and they have fun and it's an exciting time. This year is gonna be equally exciting. So go to our website, you'll find the link there where you can register your children. There's just a few spaces left and time is quickly passing. So if you have an interest, won't you please join us I know that there's a blessing in your children participating in our Vacation Bible School. Next, I want to share with you that Westover Baptist Church is turning 80 years old. 
I don't look like it, do I? Well, no, hopefully not. But for 80 years, we have served this community. Together as a community, we have praised God. We've worshiped him. We've come to him in times of joy, times of need, times of sorrow. And as a community, as a church, we have always supported one another. We are a Bible-based church where Jesus is preached, where the Holy Spirit is shared and, and honored, and where God is recognized as the maker of heaven and earth. And so we will celebrate our anniversary on September the 27th. Why don't you go to our website and find out additional details of how you can join us and be with us in this worthy time that God has blessed, that we celebrate what he has done for this church. Prayer is important. It's critical. It's a time that we have to spend with God, to talk to him, to share our heart, not just to ask for things. Certainly he's told us to do that. He said, you have not because you ask not, but it's also a time to thank him for each and every blessing that he's given us. It's a time to acknowledge his protection and care that he's placed over our lives. It's a time to recognize that he is God. An important part of our responsibility as prayer warriors is to pray intercessorily for our brothers, our sisters, our world, and, and, our, and our communities. We have a place on our website where we solicit your prayers. We can keep them confidential if you ask, but there is power in people praying together. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, touching and agreeing, he would be in the midst. He is saying that if we pray together, he honors that and he, he wants to hear from us. And then we are to share the burdens of our brothers and sisters. One scripture says that if you know that your brother or sister has been overcome with a fault or an ailment or an illness, go to them and help them and help them also through prayer. Won't you enjoy me in prayer as we petition our God and thank him? Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you are. You're all magnificent. You're all powerful. You're everywhere. The psalmist said, no matter where I go, you are there. And Lord, we lift up the concerns of our life. I pray, Lord, for our children who will be returning to school shortly. I pray, Lord, for the leaders of the school districts and the teachers, Lord, that you give them wisdom, Lord, to make the right decisions. I pray for your protection, dear Father, over the teachers and the children, each and every family, Lord. Lord, this pandemic is nothing that we can control. But Lord, I have faith and confidence that through you, there will be an answer. Through you, there will be a healing. And through you, Lord, we will move past this period in our history. You are able. I pray, Lord, for our officials from the world to the nation, to the state, to our county, Father. Guide them, dear Father. Help them to know that you will provide for them the answers that they seek as they, Lord, represent and lead your people. Lord, we thank you for our lives that you have given us for this day. This is a day that you have made and we will rejoice in this day that you've given us. You've taught us to pray when, as you did your disciples there in, 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 in the Bible, you said, give us this day our daily bread. And so, Lord, we're not going to worry about tomorrow. We're not going to put an emphasis on what happened yesterday. But, Lord, bless this day that you have given us. And, Father, let us use this day that you've given us to bring you glory and to use it for something that can never be gained or had again. Thank you, dear Lord. Lord, we claim your grace and protection and peace. We claim that your word says that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And as the psalmist has said, as David has said, 
we want to seek to dwell in your house all the days of our life. Lord, we ask you to give us guidance. Lord, there are so many obstacles and challenges that we face. But if you lead us, if you guide us, if we can hear a word from you, Lord, we can move forward with the confidence that it will work out. So give us your guidance, dear Lord. And Father, we thank you for what you have provided and ask, Lord, that you continue to provide for our needs. You said that you would. And so we trust you to do that. Whether there's a lot on the cupboard or it is nothing, we know and trust that you will provide. Whether the bank account is overfilled and overrunning or whether, Lord, we're rubbing two pennies together, I know that you will provide for our needs. And Lord, remember our world. This is your world. The song the children sing and is, Lord, you have the whole world in your hands. And so, Father, keep us and protect us. We submit our lives to you, our will to you. And we thank you as our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we will receive the word of God from Reverend Earl Moore. Reverend Moore has been blessed in many ways. He's enjoyed 23 years of marriage with Deacon Angela Gladys Moore. He's blessed their union with three beautiful children, Gabrielle, who was a senior at the University of Pittsburgh, Micah, who was a sophomore at Virginia Tech, and young Aaron is a student at West Potomac High School. Reverend Moore is a graduate of Howard University and also George Mason University School of Law. He's currently pursuing a Master's of Divinity at John Leland Theological Seminary. He and his family are members of Alfred Street Baptist Church, where they have faithfully served for many years. Let us hear now from the Lord as Reverend Moore comes to us with a message. Good morning, Westover Baptist Church. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I first want to take the opportunity to thank Pastor Youngblood for the opportunity to stand in this sacred space and proclaim what thus saith the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. There's a word from the Lord this morning. I first want to start with the scripture. The message comes from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 12 through 27. Let us read together. Just as a body though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. 
and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. This is the word of God for the people of God. I would like to preach and teach from the title, The Dangers of Body Shaming in the Church. The term body shaming was coined many years ago. It coincided with the rise of social media when people flooded the internet with pictures at the beach, on vacation, at weddings, and many other settings. People's bodies literally appeared everywhere. Body shaming is so ingrained in society that it's in the dictionary. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines body shaming as the act or practice of subjecting someone to criticism or mockery for supposed bodily faults or imperfections. And Philip Ellis, a journalist from the United Kingdom stated, far from being isolated incidents, these jokes only highlight the fact that body shaming is very much a problem among men as well as women, with public figures deemed fair game when it comes to criticisms of their appearance. I would further suggest that the overload of pictures invite strangers to feel free to comment on the pictures of people's body. Many of the comments are harsh and insensitive at the least. Strangers are emboldened to speak about the bodies of others. Someone in a bathing suit would be told he should be ashamed for wearing such clothing while being overweight. People are told their clothing do not fit their body type. Their tan line was showing and does not look good. Their arms are too flabby. You don't have a six pack, so you should not wear that outfit. Your ears are too big. You're too short. You're too tall. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're too dark. You're too light. And celebrities are the victims as well, but they would argue that they did not sign up for this. Jessica Simpson was criticized for not losing pregnancy weight too soon. Selena Gomez was talked about because the scars from her kidney transplant were visible. Gigi Hadid was criticized for being too skinny and she eventually responded that she was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease. Serena Williams was told that her body is built like a man Leonardo DiCaprio went on vacation and was made fun of online for a lack of a six pack. Aaron Carter, the singer, overheard someone say he looks like he has cancer because of his weight. Ben Affleck was described as his gut pooching outward. The research has found that people frequently using these platforms have a body shaming and body image problem. Social media platforms are ultimately toxic for body image. It cultivates a risk of being the target of someone else's body shaming comments. As Christians, we should not be surprised how those in the secular society treat one another. The unfortunate reality is that a form of body shaming also occurs in the church. Some of you can testify today that the church can sometimes be a platform that is toxic for the body of Christ.
Paul said that the church is the body of Christ. However, the members of Christ's body are not so nice to one another. Someone listening right now knows a church member somewhere who stopped going to church as a result of how they were treated. I believe many of us can relate to this. Church members engage in comparing preachers to one another rather than recognizing their individual gifts. If a church has multiple choirs, there are grumblings about which choir is better. Soloists are pitted against soloists. Members who work in the background, such as media, children's programs, and other low visibility members, ministries are appreciated or thanked. The ministry of the ushers and greeters are capable of being done by anyone. The member who is experiencing life's challenges are ignored. The Sunday school teacher's preparation is minimized. Members have been subjected to gossip and backbiting. Members can be critical of one another's clothing choices. The member who has yet to find a job is criticized for not trying hard enough. The member who has been sick for months may get the side eye look like she is simply not praying right or reaping what she sowed. The young adults are criticized for wanting to hear gospel music rather than the hymns of the church. When the pastor is away, some members skip service as if the body of Christ stops ministering when the pastor is gone. Paul established the Corinthian church and discovered that body shaming was occurring in the church. As a result, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to address problems in the church. Paul's letters were called occasional letters. They were occasional because he wrote them to churches he founded to address internal issues. The city of Corinth has some similarities to this DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Corinth had ports in the east and north. The DMV has harbors in Oxon Hill, Maryland, Baltimore, Old Town, Alexandria, and DC. Corinth was the capital of the province of Achaia and DC is our nation's capital. Corinth had a transient population and the DMV has military personnel coming through, workers and students from other countries, contractors and many others. Corinth was remarkably diverse and influential like the DC area. Church members were from both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. The community had a mixed social status. The problems that resulted were carried over from their experience in the pagan world and it was brought into the assembly of God. They tended to judge each other and even their mentors. Spiritual elitism led to factionalism. They defined themselves by their differences rather than their commonalities. The apostle Paul loved using comparisons and analogies to explain theological concepts. Verse 12 of our text reads as follows. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Paul obviously had to think about what concept would explain the church's role and relation to Christ. Paul came up with the human body. The church is metaphorically the body of Christ with its many parts. The body is interdependent on the other parts. The body should work together as a unit. Paul is trying to tell them that, I know all of you of the Corinthian church have different backgrounds, different gifts, but you have unity in Christ and must work together. Now, I was reminded of this as we found ourselves in this pandemic. I ran track in high school. Now to fast forward to the present, I did not run as frequently as in the past, but during this shutdown, I began to run weekly. Each week I would try to increase my distance. 
At the same time, I would develop a new injury. My calves would begin to hurt. Then I remembered that I had to do exercises to strengthen my calves. Once I did that, I started running again. Then my hamstrings would hurt. I started to recognize again that I needed to do exercises to strengthen my hamstrings. I started running again. Then my knees. So I did separate exercises to strengthen my knees. You get the picture. I was reminded that all the parts of my lower body had to be strengthened to work together at the goal of running. Regardless of how small the muscle was, it impacted my ability to run. Each body part or muscle has a role or function to play. Paul is simply telling the Corinthian church that each member of the community has a role to play in the body of Christ. There should not be any rivalries because all are needed to function effectively and efficiently. The goal is to make the name of Jesus Christ great. The goal is the great commission of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. The goal is not to promote ourselves, but to promote Jesus Christ. Now there are dangers to body shaming in the church. The church, which is the body of Christ, cannot function if its members are not functioning. There are at least three dangers I would like you to consider. The first danger is invisible members. Verses 15 through 16 reads, Now if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body of Christ, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. I would argue that when we body shame members, they feel they are not needed or are not valuable. They begin to compare themselves to others and devalue their gifts because they get the sense that others are appreciated more. Then they are treated as invisible, or they become invisible simply by not showing up. Have you ever joined a ministry after Pastor Youngblood rallied the conversation or the congregation to say they need your help? But once you arrive, meeting after meeting, you were not seen or acknowledged. You were not assigned any task. You then began to question your value. You may even observe that others are being asked to do tasks. You begin to compare yourself with that person. You begin to feel invisible and eventually stop going to those meetings. Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20 reads as follows. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I would suggest as members of Christ's body, we must go and make disciples. Invisible members cannot do that. Missing members cannot do that. Matthew 25 verses 35 through 36 reads as follows. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Again, I would suggest the body of Christ must meet all those needs. Every member is called to address one of those needs. If members do not show up, someone may go hungry, someone may remain naked, and someone will not be visited. The reality is that invisible members are still a part of the body, but simply missing. Another danger is 
impaired members. Verses 18 through 19 reads as follows. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? Impaired is defined as weakened or damaged, having a disability of a specified kind. Body shaming in the church can damage or weaken members and prevent them from functioning as God desires. God placed you where he wanted you and gave you gifts to function in a certain way. My son was amazed that Lynn manuel Miranda, who wrote the script, lyrics, and music for the Broadway musical Hamilton. Lynn manuel had to decide who would play what parts. He had to decide what instruments to utilize. Many would agree that he is incredibly talented. I am sure if characters or people were missing from that musical, that it would not function as he wanted and would not have received such rave reviews. Consider an orchestra. A typical orchestra has four groups of instruments, woodwinds, brass, percussion, and strings. A complete orchestra would consist of about 100 instruments. The composer knows exactly what instruments she wants and where. We are amazed at the music produced by top-notch orchestras. God is the ultimate creator and composer. God has a role for each member of the body of Christ. There's a unique sound that God wants each member to play. If the instrument or member is missing, the music simply does not sound right. Jeremiah 29, 11 reads, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I would submit to you that the sovereign God who orchestrated creation in Genesis is the same God who placed the members in the body. The final danger for your consideration is injured members. Verse 26 reads, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. If we injure our own members by body shaming, how can we suffer with that member when we cause the harm? If you ever had back pain, you would realize that it impacts your entire body. Things hurt that you did not know could hurt. Rather than body shaming itself, Paul says that the body should instinctively run to the aid of other body parts. If that does not happen, it is considered abnormal. A medical doctor would tell you that white blood cells are the cells of the immune system which help protect the body against infectious diseases or foreign invaders. I would argue that the members of the body of Christ should act as white blood cells for one another. A medical doctor would also tell you that an autoimmune disease happens when the body's natural defense system cannot tell the difference between your own cells and foreign cells, causing the body to mistakenly attack normal cells. There are more than 80 types of autoimmune diseases that can affect a wide range of body parts. I would argue that if the Apostle Paul were here today, he would agree with the statement that the body of Christ that body shames its members has an autoimmune disease. Now let me remind you that the dangers of body shaming in the church is that it creates one, invisible members. It creates impaired members and it creates injured members. 
There's a song that I believe the Apostle Paul would agree illustrates what is being said in this passage. The artist is Hezekiah Walker. And the title of the song is, I Need You to Survive. The words go like this. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with the words of my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. The Bible declares a house divided is a house that will fall. My charge to you, Westover Baptist Church, is that you not perpetrate body shaming and that you not be a victim of body shaming. Make yourself available to the body of Christ. My prayer is that God's face would continue to shine upon the ministry of this branch of Zion. God bless you. In the message that Reverend Moore has shared with us is the word from Jesus Christ that there is salvation in me. Sin has separated us spiritually from God. God told Adam and Eve, the day that you sin, you shall surely die. And that was a spiritual death. That death can lead to eternal separation from God in this life and the life to come. But there is a way to restore the fellowship with God. And that's asking Jesus to come into your life, repenting and not acknowledging that he is the son of God. If you have not asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, it's a very simple process. Won't you receive his salvation through a prayer? Join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I recognize that I have lived and done things outside of your will. I have sinned against you. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins. I repent. I ask, Lord, that you will come into my life to be my Lord, the one that leads me, the one that guides me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died for my sins on Calvary's cross and that you rose from the dead on the third day. Because you have paid the price for my sins, through your death, and because you have rose from the dead, I have hope and knowledge that I can be in fellowship with God, that the rest of my life you are there. You said that you will never leave me nor forsake me. And Lord, you have prepared a place for me in the life to come. I accept you into my life, Lord. Thank you for the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, you have received Jesus in your life. Your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. You can receive Jesus' love and His promise to always be with you. It just doesn't start when you die. It starts right now. He said, Lo, I'm with you always. I'll never abandon you. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So won't you share this experience with me? My contact information is on the website. I'd love to talk to you about this experience and share some things with you that will help you along your Christian journey. Congratulations. We thank God for this day for this worship experience. I thank Reverend Moore for his message, 
May God continue to bless him and use him. May God continue to bless his family. Know that God loves you with all of his heart. He's given his best for you. He's given his son. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God be with you.